This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, everyone, and uh, welcome to another episode of Living Legend Lawyers. This is a program that is uh, featuring the very best and most experienced of Hawaii's lawyers, um, profiles of the attorneys, and it's a half an hour interview. I am Howard Luke. I'll be your host this afternoon. Uh, I am so honored, so honored to have uh, as my guest this afternoon, Sherry Broder. Uh, many of you may know her name, uh, many of you may know her personally. She uh, certainly has been at the pinnacle of our profession, has practiced law for over 40 years. And so, Sherry, I'd like to welcome you to the program. Aloha, Howard. It's a pleasure to be on the show with you. Okay. Oh, thanks. Well, we're friends, right? We are it, friends. And it's also yes. good to see friends again. I know it's been a while because we both have our busy lives. Yes. All right. Now, you know, Sherry has represented clients in the state of Hawaii for over 40 years, but that's not the end of the story. She's represented clients in the state courts in California, New York, other states, as well as um, uh, far and wide throughout the world, <laughs> in Singapore, in Switzerland, uh, in the Philippines. Um, and to cover all bases, I won't go through every country, but I will say also as a consultant for the United Nations. Is that correct? I was a consultant for the small island Pacific nations at the United Nations, and I've also been a consultant to the Federated States of Micronesia to that permanent mission to the United Nations. Great. Uh, Sherry and I have something in common. We both spent uh, a lot of time in Micronesia, uh, but this show is not about me, although we may touch on some of our mutual experiences. I, I will say that um, her contributions to the practice of law and, and especially to justice for the underserved as well as for uh, people who have been marginalized, have been victims of human trafficking, has been so extensive that I could just sit here for the next half hour and just read off her resume and she wouldn't have to say anything. But we're not going to do that. Uh, I will refer our viewers to an interview that you had, I think it's about three and a half years ago in February of 2015 with Jay Fidel uh, of Think Tech. Uh, it was called uh, uh, Life in the Law, I believe. And at, in that program, uh, it was a, a wonderful program. I hesitate to invite our uh, watch of viewers to um, Google it and look up that interview because I think my performance here as, you know, as the host will pale by comparison. It was a wonderful interview uh, recounting all the great accomplishments of Ms. Broder over the years. So we won't do that. I will start from a, where uh, Mr. Fidel, not where he left off, but will supplement what he uh, questioned you about. There are many great cases that I think makes that show worthwhile. You were involved with the Heptachlor case, which is of course, everyone of my generation knows about it. It took place in the 1980s, I believe, where um, a very ingenious uh, a cause of action, contract action, against, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, against uh, milk producers who uh, were found to have violated the contract, I believe, by the introduction of heptachlor, which is a pesticide, into the milk of dairy cattle. That in itself could take the rest of the show. We won't talk about that. And even more, even more notorious or prominent among your achievements is the verdict against uh, the former president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos, where you and your co-counsel uh, received an award from a federal jury here in the United States uh, District Court in the state of Hawaii by a visiting judge presiding. And the, the verdict awarded the uh, plaintiff class uh, Two billion dollars, I believe, give or take a few million. No, give or take. It was two billion. <laughs> okay. It was the two there, billion there dollar was, verdict. Um, it sounds and, like a lot of money, and it is. But uh, I, I would have uh, everyone understand that the the impetus for doing that case was really the uh, the difficulties that the uh, plaintiff class suffered, uh, well well um, documented and brought up in the trial, 
Uh, the money was actually secondary because I think it took some time to collect any amount of it, and yet you persisted. And for that, I congratulate you and your co-counsel. Oh, thank you. Well, we worked very hard to collect money, and we, we did eventually collect about uh, $28 million. And we did do two distributions in the Philippines. Of course, most of our clients were on the impoverished side because it was yeah. easier to um, abuse them without any consequences. And uh, we are still working on collecting more money. We have $40 million in New York that we're fighting over in both federal and state court. That case was decided here in Hawaii, and the judge here did award the $40 million to us. But that case went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And the Philippine government took the position that our case was interfering with foreign relations of the United States of America. And so then the State Department also filed a brief supporting the position of the government of the Philippines. And so um, Chief Justice wrote, Roberts wrote an opinion uh, setting aside the award of the $40 million to us, but uh, not giving it to the Philippines and so then uh, giving them an opportunity, time to bring their case to recover the monies, but they didn't. So then now we're in New York fighting over that money again. And we're also fighting over $26 million in federal court in New York over paintings that have been found. When uh, Ferdinand Marcos was overthrown, uh, a big truck came up to Imelda's townhouse on the Upper West Side in New York City, and they unloaded everything that was in the house. And where did it go from? She, you know, she had uh, Monet paintings and you know all kinds of very expensive, famous paintings. So we're fighting over those funds, those paintings. Who do those belong to, and how will the money be divided up? That's amazing. You could create your own museum. Right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, and that's only said partially tongue in cheek because yeah. it sounds like there was some, uh, from what I understand, some pretty fabulous artworks that could have ended up in the Louvre, for example, right? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, one of them, the uh, the Monet water lilies painting sold for $40 million. It, she it, had that. She, yeah. Well, she had one yeah. of them. There's many of them. But that's like a discounted price because people weren't sure of the provenance of it, you know, which is a big thing today in the art world. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so there's m more paintings of other very famous artists. So has the, um, the continued litigation caused you to travel? Do you have to go to New York? Do you have to go to DC? Or do you travel? Or do you have other people doing that for you? Uh, well, my, one of my co-counsels is located in Philadelphia. And I, we have also have co-counsel in New York. So. Um, I have traveled to those locations, but it depends on mm -hmm. the kind of hearing it is. And because, uh, well, some of the cases is, some of the uh, uh, Merrill Lynch deposit cases in state court, but the uh, artwork cases are in federal court. Because the way we found out about it is they sold the Monet painting and they didn't pay taxes. So it was actually the taxing authorities that brought it to the attention of people that, that, that they had these paintings. Um, so for that, you know, today in federal court, most federal courts are very technologically right. savvy. And you can easily appear by telephone. Sometimes they, you know, have video conferencing facilities and the judges are very generous in terms of allowing you to work that way. Oh, that's great. Well, so it's an IRS man. It's all like Al Capone redux, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah got to be careful with other your taxes. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, um, you know, I, at some point, I, I want to weave into our uh, interview this afternoon your, um, your wonderful life story with uh, your incredibly uh, uh, wonderful husband, John Van Dyke. He was uh, an international lawyer, well-known throughout mm -hmm. not just Hawaii, but and not just throughout the nation, but through the world. And he had so many uh, people who considered him their mentor uh, in South Korea, in other countries. Uh, certainly, he stood at the vanguard in the law of the sea and international law. And uh, uh, of course, I'm sorry uh, that he uh, suffered an untimely uh, death, but 
Uh, you carry on his work. You're a director of the John Van Dyke Institute of International Justice, I believe. Is that right? It's the John Van Dyke Institute of International Law and Justice, but I find that people can't remember the whole name, so I've shortened it to John yeah. Van Dyke Institute. Okay, but yeah. it, the focus uh, is international because, of course, John you know, also taught constitutional law, and he was very active in that area. I wrote a book on juries, uh, you know, on our, our first date. Mm -hmm. He said, I said to him, oh, he said to me, what have you been doing? I said, oh, I've been backpacking in the Sierras, camping yeah. out, and everything. He said, what have you been doing? He said, oh, I just finished my second book, which is on, you know, the selection of juries. Right. Um, but the, the Institute concentrates on uh, international law issues right. and human rights. Both you and John have uh, so many great publications. Uh, I think your husband, of course, could write like uh, the way that most of people would uh, be writing up their shopping list at Costco. <laughs> He'd sit down and write a great treatise on international law. Uh, and I, I've read some of his work, a spectacular writer, uh, both not only in the content but also in the manner in which he... Uh, he wrote about the subjects that uh, were in his interest mm -hmm. at the time. You know, uh, Sherry has practiced alongside or with so many attorneys of great note, um, including uh, mentioned in the last interview you had with uh, Charles Gary. I think the older mm -hmm. generation of attorneys remember that he was among, if not the preeminent uh, criminal lawyer in the uh, 60s and 70s and you worked alongside of him. Again, that, would, that was amply covered by the interview with uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Fidel. But you also worked with other people. You, um, you worked with uh, the current Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Roberts, is that right? That is right. Um, Tell us about that. Okay, well, you know, for many years I've done work for the Office of Foreign Affairs. In fact, for my entire professional mm -hmm. career, I've done work for Native Hawaiian people. And we uh, brought a case that we believe because of the apology resolution mm -hmm. where the U.S. Congress apologized for the illegal overthrow and the taking of the lands of the Hawaiian people and their sovereignty without their consent and without compensation, mm -hmm. we thought, well, you know, it's time for a, you know, a big settlement of Native Hawaiian claims. And we, what, I want, what we wanted to do was to try to do something similar to what had been done in Alaska. In Alaska, Secretary of, the Secretary of the Interior at the time, Udall, mm -hmm. uh, this, Morris, was, in the Udall. The, this yeah. was in the late 60s. There were claims by the Native Alaskans to land that were unresolved. And so he put a moratorium on the sale of any lands in Alaska until the claims of the Native Alaskans were resolved. Of course, in Alaska, the oil companies were very eager to start drilling, and they didn't like this moratorium on the sale of land because they wanted to buy land, you know, and start drilling. So they went to Congress and got, you know, the Native Alaskan Claims Act passed uh, in order to uh, uh, release the moratorium. So we sued for a moratorium here based on the apology resolution that the lands were taken without compensation and without consent, thinking that this would lead to you know, some pressure to resolve the, some of the claims of the Native Hawaiian people. We will continue with this after our break. Okay. This is fascinating. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come banging on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You could talk to God, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests 
talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back and um, we're with Sherry Broder who uh, is our guest today. Very honored to have her here. I think, you know, uh, one of the things that people are quite interested in when they view cases that they may or may not be aware of is not only the content of the cases, but the character of the individuals with whom you may have worked. For example, um, I don't know if this is too much information, but how, how, did you get along with, how was John Roberts, our Supreme Court Justice? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking that. As a Chief Justice, of course, he is uh, at the very top, the apex of the ivory tower. Um, that doesn't mean that he's not a human being, but he certainly was more accessible, I think, when he was co-counsel with you. So. Well, um, he, he was a, actually a very nice person to work with. Uh, you know, those people that make it to that level of the law practice where they are what you call Supreme Court practitioners, U.S. Supreme mm -hmm. Court practitioners. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with a, f a few of them, and they've all had the absolute best manners, been very gracious in all respects. And uh, I enjoyed working with John Roberts a lot. He, uh, you know, I knew more about mm -hmm. the facts about, you know, native law. Uh, than he did, and he, and especially law here in Hawaii, and he always acted like, you know, I really knew what I was talking about, and he was <laughs> definitely going to listen. Um, uh, so I, I enjoyed working with him quite a bit, actually. Um, he, he, was a, he was a solicitor general at the time? No, he was not. Yeah. He was not. He, he did become a circuit court judge first, and then he became a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, uh, let me just tell you, when we, got, we took the break, I didn't get a chance to tell you the end of the, okay. the, what the case is right. about. Okay, because it's such a fascinating case. Okay, so we went and sought a moratorium on the sale of any lands from the public land trust here in Hawaii because, of course, you know, most of the state lands are lands from the Hawaiian Kingdom that were taken by the provisional government and then after the illegal overthrow and then given to the territory and then the territory gave it to the state at the time of admissions. And so we were seeking uh, this moratorium and we did get a unanimous decision from the Hawaii Supreme Court upholding a moratorium mm -hmm. and looking to many statements made by the Hawaii State Legislature uh, and by the governors in terms of their commitment to uh, the first people of our lands to talk about, uh, you know, some reconciliation and resolution of the claims of the Native Hawaiian people. So we did have a unanimous decision. Uh, but one thing that I learned when cert was granted was <laughs> that, okay, once cert is granted, you're in trouble. And cert being granted means the case goes from a federal appellate court or a state court to the United States Supreme Court. Well, there well, is I mean, a, a direct Supreme appeal. Court, there's a direct appeal for yeah. a state, yeah. from a decision of a state Supreme Court to, a, to the United yeah. States Supreme Court. Right. There's a direct appeal, just in that very limited mm -hmm. circumstance. Uh, and so, you know, we were uh, advised strongly that you've got to get somebody who regularly practices right. before the court. Before the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. You know, you have worked with uh, so many uh, attorneys whose names I know of, uh, whose work I may or may not be somewhat familiar with. Uh, including uh, an individual who was portrayed by John Travolta in a, <laughs> oh. <laughs> in a movie, a civil action, I believe, Jan Schlickman, also with, uh, uh, with a deputy uh, solicitor general under President Obama. Is that right? Yes, I worked with Neil Katyal, yeah. um, and he, uh, I worked with him on another case involving the rights and entitlements of Native Hawaiians. That was State of Hawaii versus OHA? Or? That was, okay, you know what, I got to back up. The case that I worked mm -hmm. on with John Roberts was Rice versus Cayetano. Right. That was the 15th Amendment case. 
The case I just described, I worked on with Neil Katyal. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. That's, yeah. That was the case, uh, the state against OHA, is that right? State v. Yeah. OHA. So that's the one I worked on with Neil right. Katyal. But I, I just worked on with him uh, during the cert petition. You know, aside from working with uh, attorneys and bringing cases in courts, you've also worked as an arbitrator. Now, the, the direction of the law, at least in Hawaii and in most of our states now, is to move away from actual trials by mm -hmm. uh, by combat in the courts yeah. to uh, mediation arbitration. And you serve, uh, you're upstaging everyone once again because, you know, they're arbitrators <laughs> and I, I was a court appointed uh, court arbitrator, but you yeah. were an international arbitrator and you still are. Or Yes, are you, I am. What is that all about? Well, I had this one very interesting case where, um, you know, I think because I do teach international law and international ocean law at the law school, I was, I was picked for this particular case. And it was a case where a Taiwanese uh, tuna fishing vessel went aground in a remote atoll, Europec, in the state of Yap in the Federated States of Micronesia. And it was really an insurance dispute. You know, how much was Lloyd's of London going to pay? And of course, uh, Lloyd's of London's been doing insurance policies mm -hmm. for the maritime industry for the last 150 years. So they got a pretty tight policy that uh, is sewn up. Uh, so the Lloyd's of London picked Sir David Steele, who's a barrister, an English barrister in London, and he regularly gets picked by Lloyds of London for these kinds of disputes. And I was chosen by the people of Europec. And the very interesting thing, we were under the, we had to go according to the insurance contract, which says that you have to use the 1996 Arbitration Act of England and Wales. And the unusual thing in the contract was that there were only two arbitrators. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you don't agree? And the way it it worked so was... So you were one of the two? I was one and of the two. And who was the other? He was Sir David was, Steele. Okay, so okay. Did he have, did he have Sir, to wear a white wig? With the, you know? he, we, we would meet once in a while by Skype, and he would be, yeah. He would be in the he troll would be in regalia. His, he would and, be yeah, all yeah. ready to go. Did you have to dress like that, too? I don't have any wigs yet, <laughs> <Okay>. anyways. <laughs> all right. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, the, the way it worked was you know, when you issue a judgment or an order, the parties can't get it until they pay your bill up to that point. So, so if you don't agree and you don't issue an order, then you don't get paid. Mm. So mm -hmm. we, we did issue one order, which we agreed on, but then when we got to the second order, we didn't agree. So. The rules did provide a provision to pick a third arbitrator, but the other two parties had to, we could pick that person, but the other two parties first had to agree to go outside the insurance contract. There's no penalty kick like in soccer. <laughs> you're tied, right? So, no, no, yeah, you yeah, got to pick no. the third. But the parties wouldn't agree to the third arbitrator. So, oh, so what's happened? Oh, well, the case was going on simultaneously in the courts of the FSM and also then they ended up going on in the courts of Guam and uh, it became a big logistical oh. legal nightmare, you know, those Still procedural. Ongoing? No. In the end, the parties settled That's and good. then we, we got paid. Good. So. Good to hear that. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I know you had a sterling career as a student. You went to Wellesley College. You were order of the COI, the top 10% at... Uh, University of California, Bolt Hall School of Law. And uh, one of the things that is quite impressive for all of our listeners, our viewers, uh, is the fact that you were the first woman president of the Hawaii State Bar Association. And that was in 1993, wasn't it? It was. And, and you, I, I remember that we actually spoke back then. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you, took, a, you took a lot of... Um, took a lot of thought on your part, a lot of considerations. So can you talk about how, it, how you ar arrived at deciding to throw your hat in the ring and winning? Well, you know, I had run before to be treasurer 
And um, after I got elected, Bill McCorston had been involved in counting the votes. And so he called me up and said, you got to run for president. You know, you, I know you can win. And uh, so that sort of was the seed of the thought. I, I thought about it a little bit, but uh, actually Helen Gilmore had mm -hmm. run before me, and she always jokes with me and says, oh, you know, I, Sherry, I, you got to be president of the bars. But I always tell her, right. hey, being a federal district yeah, court a, judge a, is a good consolation senior, prize. Senior uh, United States district judge yeah. is, is uh, you know, not, not a bad gig. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the... You know, you mentioned about your advocacy for Native Hawaiians. I know, I do know, and I think it's quite impressive that only three years out of law school and being in Hawaii, uh, you became a chief deputy attorney for the Constitutional Convention assigned to Hawaiian Affairs. Right. How did you manage that and with so little experience and being from, you know, a, a very distant state, state of Maine? Well, you know, I had worked for Jim Funaki at the House. Okay majority attorney's mm -hmm. office at the Hawaii State Legislature mm -hmm. and uh, we got along quite well and he he was asked to be the chief attorney and he immediately asked me to be the deputy chief attorney and I think the way I ended up with the Hawaiian Affairs Committee was that I thought it sounded like super exciting yeah. that would be a great thing to do and I think that other the other lawyers thought maybe judiciary or legislature yeah. Well, we're uh, glad be. you did that. Now, I'm <laughs> going to have to, I was, I'd like to hear more, and uh, you have you managed to uh, be counsel for OHA in many capacities, but we only have a little bit of time, I've been uh, told. So I'd like to ask you this. You know, I had uh, Lowell chun Hoon and Eric Seitz on the show in the past, and they emphasized the, that despite all the indications of younger lawyers, some of them, uh, and even lawyers of and maybe more so, lawyers of our generation having, you know, having some difficulty in adjusting to some of the developments most recently in terms of the access to justice for the poor, for the downtrodden. Uh, what words of wisdom, if any, could you tell our younger lawyers and, and tell me about that? Well, you know, being a lawyer is a privilege, mm -hmm. and you can go to court and you can ask a judge to administer justice. That's a fantastic thing. And I think as we look around today and we see so many homeless people, we see how difficult it is to live in Hawaii, how expensive it is. Uh, we see many unfair things going on. We see poor people with being the subject of human trafficking. We see pharmaceutical companies selling uh, drugs that make people addicted and can cause them to die. You know, we have an, an epidemic of bad things happening and the courts can be a place to, to go to for relief. And so I think today more than ever is the time for people to go study law, become lawyers, and reach out to our community to help make our community a better place. You know, Sherry Broder has uh, sort of lived the dream that many young attorneys have to make a significant contribution to society, to our local communities, and to a larger community. In her case, uh, to the world. Uh, Ms. Broder has spent decades now completely committed, and I believe uh, I may stand to be corrected, she's been basically a sole practitioner, which shows you uh, how someone can get together with other attorneys of mutual interest and achieve what, um, what is really the mission statement of the Hawaii State Bar Association, which is to promote justice and ensure that uh, everyone who is underserved uh, can achieve some measure of justice in this world. So thank you, Sherry, for being here. Gosh, I'm starting to get warmed up, but um, <laughs> you know it's wonderful to have you here. We're going to talk after we go off the air, all right? Okay. And I'll see you at the bar dinner. And that's the Hawaii State Bar Association yes, dinner. Yes, August 11th. August 11th. And it's a fundraiser. And it's a fundraiser. For poor people. For poor people. And, and projects where lawyers serve the poor. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, on this show of Living Legend Lawyers, our guest, Sherry Broder. Aloha. Thank you.